Hello, hello and welcome to our spotlight session here uh, in April of our as third one, actually, you know, the fourth one in this year. And uh, thank you very much for joining. My name is Uli Weinberg. I'm the director of the School of Design Thinking in Potsdam. And also the I have the pleasure to direct the Global Design Thinking Alliance, the GDTA. And that is a joint activity here. And uh, I'm happy that we can distract you a little bit from the sad news you, you, we are all witnessing from Ukraine every day and focus today with our spotlight here on VNA Dundee and design thinking. And I'm really happy that we have uh, two very special guests today. And uh, especially I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to have a found, founding member of the GDTA here as well uh, with the VNA Dundee, with the Victoria and Albert Museum to, uh, to relieve the V and the A um, in Dundee and Scotland. And I'm looking forward to our speakers, to Lynn Martin, the strategic lead of design, lead for design for business at VNA Dundee, and Annie Mars. She is actually the lead officer at UNESCO City of Design Dundee. And uh, both they will talk about the power of networks. And, um, and it would be, uh, I'm, I'm really interested in your experiences actually in uh, during the past years uh, with design thinking in that fabulous museum where I haven't got the chance to really physically visit. I saw the construction uh, pictures lots of years ago and uh, saw photographs from the building. And uh, Claudia, my colleague, was already there at a conference at the very, very beginning. And I'm happy to learn now more about your activities and uh, what do mushrooms and museums have in common? That is the question I try to answer myself. So for all of you who are new to our GDTA spotlight here, uh, that is an open Zoom call. Uh, we ask you to shut down your microphones and uh, also your videos at the beginning for the first half hour because the first half hour is dedicated to Lynn Martin and, and to Anne, Annie Mars, uh, to our guest speakers here. And uh, But please collect your questions um, and uh, also start typing in the questions in the chat already. And after half an hour, I think both of them will take uh, about 15 minutes after half an hour, we open the Zoom call to a discussion and we open the videos and, and the microphones if you want to say something. And if there is, so, and usually we go for a full 60 minutes, which means our time here at five o'clock in Germany, we'll, we'll stop. And usually I hear the church bells ringing here next to me. And that is a good sign for me. But if there is a little bit more time um, over and, and more interested, I hope um, Annie and Lynn will have a little bit more time um, for a kind of fireside chat at the end. I see lots of members joining here from around the globe. Um, I see Shui Lin Lin from China. Welcome. I see Raluca uh, joining from Romania. I see Nalin from India joining. Uh, I see Lakshman from India joining. Joanne from New York. Welcome. I see what who I see Andre from Cologne. Uh, yeah. So, but now I would like to hand over to Lynn. Lynn Martin, the strategic lead for design for business at VNA Dundee, and uh, she is she recently joined um, Andrew Cameron, the person um, who was the founding uh, the the part or who did the kind of the founding step into the GDTA round uh, five years ago. He left VNA Dundee, and Lynn is now taking his position and i would 
like to hand over to you, Lynn. We're looking forward to your presentation and also to any later. So please, the stage is yours. Really, thank you so much. And thank you for the lovely introduction as well. Um, and thank you again for inviting me to speak. It's a bit of an honor to be invited to the GDTA to, to talk a little bit about the next stage of design for business at VA Dundee and what it is that we're about to get up to. But before I do that, just a little bit of background on myself and Annie, <clears throat> who'll be talking, chatting to you this afternoon as well. We don't come from a design background. Uh, we do, however, use design as a way to engage people and improve the experience of design in our respective fields. And for Annie at UNESCO City of Design Dundee, that's working in communities. And for me, with the Design for Business program at v &A Dundee, it's working with businesses and organizations to help them access the design process to do more of what they do really well. So basically, both Annie and I are here for the experiential dissemination for design in our respective fields. The title of today's talk is Entangled Values, the Power of Networks. But before I get started on talking about the power of networks, I'd like to take you for a walk in your favourite woodland. Now, everyone's cameras are off, so feel free to close your eyes and just imagine a lovely autumn day. It is, it's just turned spring here in Scotland, but I'm gonna fast, fast forward to that other brilliant part of the year when things start popping up out of the ground. Imagine you're in your favourite green space, your favourite woodland, and it is a beautiful autumn day. The golden sunlight is filtering through branches and falling in pools at your feet and the fallen leaves. And you're in that brilliant state that we get into when we're in nature, which is alert and aware, but really relaxed and calm. And you're just enjoying your time out in nature, enjoying the sunshine, enjoying the crunch of leaves under your feet. When suddenly you spot something just on the right hand side of the path and it's a mushroom. And it's a really good one. And it probably, feel free to open your eyes now, it might look something like this one. She says confidently, trying to make sure that the, there we go. It looks like this one. It's got an amazing red cap. It's covered in white dots. It's a proper fairy tale mushroom. It is an excellent part, a piece of natural architecture. You go up to it, you admire the colors, the shapes, the forms. It's a gorgeous thing. And delighted as you spend time with it, you might take some photographs for your Instagram, you enjoy the drama of it as you see it emerging alone from the forest floor. It's part of the landscape, but also apart from it. And your day is enriched by this encounter, this mysterious brilliant thing that you've seen, this form that you've enjoyed spending time with. And if you're anything like me and how I enjoy nature, I think that moments like that can seem like they can't get any richer. I think that's kind of the purest thing that we do as humans and connect with nature in that way. Except the more you know, the richer those experiences become. So imagine how much more enriching that initial encounter with that mushroom would be if you were aware of the fact that that one mushroom is connected with the entire forest floor through a network of root-like threads. That while you were taking pictures of the mushroom for your Instagram, that mushroom was exchanging nutrients and information across a network right along the forest floor with hundreds of other fungi, plants, and trees. Not a standalone thing at all, but an interconnected entity nourishing and being nourished by its network. Now I'm gonna take you on another little walk. Along the riverside, in my hometown of Dundee, along the side of the River Tay. Now, as you walk along the waterfront, you can see another impressive piece of architecture inspired by nature and inspiring for that. You can admire the drama of it as it emerges from the ground. It's part of the landscape, but apart from it. And you can walk around it, admiring its form, admiring its shapes. You can go inside it and experience exhibitions about design. And you can take some excellent pictures for your Instagram and leave delighted by your encounter with VA Dundee. But imagine, just like that time with the mushroom, how much richer your encounter would have been if you knew about the invisible networks that reached out from and into VA Dundee. Networks that touch schools and communities, universities, colleges, businesses, and of course, the Global Design Thinking Alliance. 
v a Dundee, when you see it as a building, and just let me show you, it can look like a monolith, like a monolithic entity standing on its own, but absolutely nothing could be further from the truth. v a Dundee is a physical manifestation of collective values. It is a testament to the power of imagination and intention for a city and for a country. We're a place where information is exchanged, where design can be experienced, and where multiple values intersect and are amplified. And Design for Business are incredibly fortunate to be playing a part of that in the next phase of v &A Dundee, and you'll find out a little bit more about that later. We want to take our cues from our fungal networks, though. We're not just about sharing information, we are here to share nutrients as well. And what does sharing nutrients look like for a non-organic entity? Well, for me, action nutrients are basically actions in service to your network or to an idea. So for today, I'm going to share information with you about the next phase of Design for Business at v and Dundee. And I'm also looking for nourishment as well to help us with our next phase of our growth. So as you're listening to me talk today, if you have any experience in the areas that I outline, please get in touch if you think you can offer insights or connections or publications or anything at all related. Um, I'd really appreciate your support. But I don't want to be a greedy little mushroom as well. I do want to make sure that I nourish back and it's a reciprocal exchange. So if you like what you hear today and you think we can work together, then please just get in touch and we can start having those conversations. So I'd like to let you know now just a little bit about what it is Oh, can you, did you all hear that? That's really strange, hang on. Um, I'm just gonna, here we go. So I have been, oh, apologies. Um, can you all see that, Annie, can I get a thumbs up if you can see it? Thank you. Yeah, um, so we've joined, I've joined v &A at a really interesting time. For the past year, um, we've been working on a vision and mission for the organisation, what well, my colleagues have before I joined. And these four priorities that you can see here have come out of the vision and mission work for v &A Dundee. So this is where we are heading towards. So we want to cultivate a creative, climate conscious, connected, diverse, dynamic and entrepreneurial organisation. We want to generate joy and spark curiosity in design across all of our audiences. We want to grow our civic role as a museum and deepen our social impact. And we want to become Scotland's design champion. And as I talk you through the ideas that I am going to work on this year for Design for Business at V&A Dundee, you'll see these little badges. And these little badges just let you know which of the V&A strategic priorities that, that particular activity is going to serve. So just let me share with you. When I first started in my first week, it was the 3rd of January, there was very little people in the office and it was myself and my manager, Graham. We sat in our meeting room and he said, Lynn, it sounds like a daunting task to be the strategic lead for this program. However, it's a collective effort. It's not you in a room with loads of post-its doing your own thing. It's a collaborative, um, collaborative thing. But my team weren't around me at that point. I thought, okay, that's fine. Like, this is good. Collaboration sounds much better than doing it all on my own. Um, and the next day I was working from home, the 4th of January, which was a bit of a grim day anyway. Um, I didn't have my team. I hadn't met them properly yet. And I was going through some old documents about design for business. And I came across the vision for design for business, which is this. Scotland, where design thinking is the go-to method for people-centred, co-created solutions to the challenges and opportunities faced by businesses, communities, and social organisations. And I read that in my strategic document, and I thought, that's a really noble cause to get behind. But part of me wondered, is it big enough? Are we thinking enough about the impact that design thinking could possibly have on Scotland? And so despite my manager's best intentions and instructions, I decided actually I'm going to give developing the vision a go. Now, this is what I came up with on the 4th of January, and this is what I've been working with for the past three months. We're still to develop a vision and mission and strategy for Design for Business Dundee. So this is entirely, this is a, a seed as opposed to the finished plan. 
but here we are. A Scotland where her citizens are inspired and empowered to build a sustainable and prosperous future through design thinking, imagination, and creativity. And if I keep that as the moonshot for design for business, I think we'll get further than we would just thinking about how we use design thinking in that sort of smaller way. But again, love to hear questions and feedback about this since this is all brand new and it's entirely up for grabs. None of this is set in stone. Um, it's ideas about how we can move this programme forward and kind of shift the dial on how Scotland experiences design. So our approach is to think like a museum. We're not a consultancy. We have excellent people working with us, um, incredible consultants, but we're not a consultancy, we're a museum. So what does being a museum mean in this space? And I mentioned there is about fundamentally shifting the dial on how Scots experience design and culture. And for Design for Business, it's about not just putting people through our World Class Accelerator program, it's about putting people through the World Class Accelerator program and then offering the world class support after in order to really start embedding design thinking within a culture. Having experienced um, the Design Thinking Accelerator myself before I, I stepped into this role, in my previous role, it's really hard. It's really hard when you go to a design thinking accelerator or a program and you get really excited about it. And then you go back into your workplace and the culture doesn't support that new way of thinking. So for us, it's about figuring out what do we need to do in order to really help embed design thinking in the organizations we work with. We're a museum. It has to be about culture. Honouring entangled values, well, what that means is understanding what our stakeholders want and seeing what activity can amplify the shared values of our stakeholders. This is a major thing for me at the moment. And collaboration, always being greater than competition. We're working for the common good. There is no room for that's my bit of design and this is your bit of design in the city or in Scotland. We have to work together to amplify it. And I see it as being a design for businesses. Um, it's our priority to make sure that we amplify as many voices in this space as we can. How are we going to get there? How are we going to get to the, the vision that I've put together? Well, at the moment, our programme is come one, come all with a problem, and we will work with you on the accelerator to, to reach a solution that's appropriate for you, helping you using design tools to do so which works really well in the diversity of organizations that we have and the sizes of organizations and the types that we work with is a real strength across the program. However, what I would like to do this year is to make our offer more pointed in alignment with the Scottish government's wellbeing economy priorities, starting with net zero. <clears throat> so looking at how can we work with businesses across Scotland in order to use design to help them reach their net zero aspirations. And if any of you have, um, experience and insight in this field, I would be very interested to talk to you and to, to hear what you have to say. Another thing I would love to do with Design for Business is work on the business support ecosystem in Scotland. My background is in this space and I know having developed and delivered programmes in the business support um, space, design's a bolt-on, it's something that people do in addition to as opposed to something that runs right through the entire and um, the entire ecosystem and the entire approach to business support in Scotland. And when you're looking at people like ourselves who run accelerator programs like Service Design Academy in Dundee, other organizations like Snook and independent designers, the ground in Scotland is not warm for design thinking approaches being accessed by businesses. It's a leap of faith to use a design thinking approach. What I would love to do is to work with the existing business support ecosystem to see how do we upskill people there? How do we help them get comfortable using frameworks and conversations with their clients? So they might start to do a little bit of that dissemination work for us and keep the ground warm for us when people decide, I need to address this challenge, I need to address this opportunity, I'm gonna use design thinking to do it because it's something that I have already experienced and know that it works. Um, how else will we get there? Joyous revenue model. I was thinking about how we take in money, how we, we work with our revenue. And the most joyous revenue model has to be pay it forward or give something back. So what I want to do is work with larger organizations who can afford to pay consultancy fees and then take the, take the money from that and channel it into 
accelerator programmes that can be accessed for SMEs and organisations who might not otherwise be able to afford design thinking, um, design thinking accelerators like the one that we run, which effectively makes our clients partners with us in dissemination of design across Scotland. Um, and there is access potentially to other pots of money that means that it's an easier sell to large organisations around CSR uh, budgets as opposed to just the R&D um, for, um, for accessing design. We're also integrating more into the museum. Historically, Design for Business has sat within VRA Dundee, but alongside some projects, and we haven't been integrated into the museum. So first off, we're working with our colleagues to integrate the four strategic priorities across the organization using design thinking tools. Um, I would like to start offering experiential um, tours for people who book on into, um, into our tours across the museum. So you come in, you look at the artifacts that are the result of design, and then you can come into Design for Business and a workshop for an hour and experience the design process in a different way. Offers to corporate members, so working with people who are already in line with VA Dundee and working with them on, um, on their own aspirations in their businesses. And the thing that I think is probably most exciting is exhibitions and live prototyping. So getting businesses in to prototype their products, letting the public see that, experience it and be part of the design process. And not only that, but also see what's happening within the city in Scotland and what amazing developments are happening and innovations are happening right across um, all sectors in Scotland as well. And being a platform for that would be very exciting. So how do we get there? And we're back to networks making more of our network to amplify our collective stories, disseminate design and create a community of practice. I'm really fortunate that I've come into a programme that is five years old and that's five years of people who have benefited wildly from design thinking and the design thinking accelerator at BNA Dundee. And what I'm hoping to do is to turn them into accomplices, basically in dissemination, establishing a community of practice working alongside people who want to really help other organizations embed design in order to make sure that we are shifting that dial on how businesses and organizations experience design in Scotland. Thank you for listening to me. Um, I'm really appreciative of the opportunity to kind of talk about what the future of design for business might look like and to, to ask of you, how can, you know, what can you input? How can you help? us grow and do this amazing thing that we want to do. I would love to um, in, introduce Annie of UNESCO City of Design Dundee, um, who is basically going to give us some incredible examples on how the UNESCO network nourishes the city um, of design and how it also nourishes the network. So thank you so much, Annie. Thank um, you. Over to you. Thank you, Lynn. You can hear me okay? Um, apologies because Lynn's going to do the slides and I'm going to do that thing where I'm like next slide uh, which is slightly frustrating um, but we'll get there so um, so just thank you so much for um, for having us uh, having us today I, I'm going to share a bit about our um, UNESCO network um, and so Dundee was designated a UNESCO city design in 2014 um, it followed on uh, a process um, which came off the back of an unsuccessful bid to be a UK city of culture. Um, but the great thing about the UNESCO designation is that this is for life. There is no time limit. Um, so where something like a UK city of culture or European city of culture is one year, um, we're unlikely to have our designation removed um, unless we do something, uh, something bad, but um, uh, hopefully we should have that for forever. Um, and we got this designation because we have a strong design history in things like print um, in textiles and manufacturing. And the designations recognize cities that are on a journey um, and a journey of growth. Uh, and Dundee's design sectors are growing in areas like gaming and, and digital design and um, in healthcare and in service design, um, as well as our independent uh, designers and makers and small studios. So um, the other big reason that Dundee received this in 2014 was our city's commitment to build V&A Dundee, Scotland's um, 
design museum. And uh, so next slide, Lynn. Um, so to be a member of the UNESCO Creative Cities Network, you have to be a city which is publicly committed to placing creativity and creative industries at the heart of your local development plan and to cooperating active, actively at an international level. Um, it's a bit of a mouthful, uh, but that includes things like um, strengthening um, the creation and production of cultural activities, um, of goods, of products, developing hubs um, for creativity and innovation, um, things like broadening opportunities um, uh, for, in our case, designers, but um, for creative people, um, improving access and participation um, in cultural life, uh, particularly for marginalised marginalized groups and, and vulnerable people, and to fully integrate culture um, and creativity in uh, the sustainable development plans for the city. So uh, next slide, Lynn. Um, so much like this group, the UNESCO Creative Cities are an international collective of cities from all over the world. Um, they are, um, they actually, just as a little side note, UNESCO Creative Cities were actually um, invented in Scotland. So Edinburgh actually pitched the idea to UNESCO back in 2004. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and then um, uh, so it's actually a Scottish, a Scottish invention. Um, but now there's over 200 um, creative cities around the world, uh, 42 in the sub network of design. Uh, the creative cities network covers seven creative fields, um, of which they are crafts and folk arts, media, film. Um, oh, I have to rattle these off. Uh, craft and folk arts, media arts, film, design, astronomy, literature, and music. Um, there we go, <laughs> got there in the end. And each of these designations is achieving an overall goal of placing creativity and creative industries at the heart of their local developments, but they'd maybe do it through music or through literature or through gastronomy. We do it through design. Um, so next slide, Lynn. Um, and in addition, the Creative Cities Network is seen as a lever um, for sustainable development and as a network for action and innovation in the implementation of Agenda 2030. Um, and as cities and as a network, we actually also um, report on the projects that we do and the ways in which um, they are contributing to achieving the sustainable development goals. And in Dundee, we have moved now to a position where all of our projects, we think, we're thinking about how, how does this work? Uh, how does this contribute to sustainable development? Um, and that's really, really, really up there actually um, for us now. Um, so uh, next slide, Lynn, there's quite a lot to um, unpa unpack um, in the Creative Cities Network. Um, and I just want to break it down, just roughly what we do in Dundee. And then I want to give you an example of a project we've recently been involved in and where design thinking and co-design has been absolutely core to, to what we do. So, um, so we've got these kind of three aims. Um, the first one is around the way in which we use design to improve people's lives um, and the way in which we engage people in design, in the work of designers and in the opportunities for participating in co-design and how citizens can directly influence the places we live and the services we use, um, use with design. Um, next slide in. Um, and then we've got the net, the network. Uh, so this is a oh, we rather blurry picture of um, when the design cities came to visit us in Dundee in 2018. And uh, so, as I said, actively participating um, is really, really, really important um, to us. Uh, and um, staging major um, international ex exhibitions, etc., is really um, important as well. Um, and I could talk forever about the international stuff, but I'll not. Um, and then the other bit is um, just about how the designation works for the actual designers in the cities. So championing designers, Dundee's designers, by promoting their talent and um, their creative and commercial success and involving them in decision making. So as a small city, um, developing creative industries are really, really important to us. And it's probably one of the things we're weakest on, um, but that we need the most. Um, and that kind of wealth of you know, small design businesses or small studios um, makes for a really diverse and interesting sector in the city, um, but they have huge issues um, and things like uh, finding affordable and um, good quality space to work in. Um, so we're always trying to kind of um, 
uh, I suppose, be a little bit of a conduit between the designers and maybe the city um, to try and just improve, to make Dundee the best place to be a designer. That's our kind of vibe. Um, and then, so next one then. Um, so we often summarise our work as um, making design visible. And uh, I would often describe that as, as the work that we do with people in communities. And just when we were talking just at the, at the start of this meeting, I think it's really interesting to think about communities as networks um, and to think about the way in which a community comes together um, just in the same way as these networks come together, the one that we hear just now or the UNESCO network, you know, because sometimes they come together around an issue or a cause or a collective interest. Um, sometimes they're geographically based. Um, they might have um, a, co a, a collective a negative experience that they want to address. And um, they might uh, come together because they identify as a particular um, gender or um, a particular uh, member of, of a community. Um, they might have a particular ethnicity. Um, they might be suffering from different injustice. I, I guess I could go on. <laughs> I guess I could go on forever, but it's, about how that group or that network of people come together and how we then support them to use design to improve their everyday lives. So as an example, I want to share with you this project, um, which I think kind of really demonstrates how we've used um, design thinking methodology as an inclusive way of engagement for people who have um, little or no experience of design. Um, so next image, please, Lynn. Um, so first of all, this isn't Dundee. Um, just in case. Um, but this uh, project really starts early in the pandemic when, and I'm sure you've seen this in your cities all around the world as well, but the Scottish government decided they needed to do something to support the return of people to our city centres and to support physical distancing in what would usually or typically be a quite crowded um, area. And that was so that people would have confidence um, uh, and feel, feel really safe. So they implemented a program called Spaces for People. Um, and this work was left with local authorities or the municipality to actually deliver. And it was implemented under emergency powers and it was done with little or no um, even consultation, let alone collaboration or participation. There was no or very little design consideration and the businesses were felt like this was being done to them. So when these interventions, um, next slide Lynn, uh, started popping up all over the place, there was a real backlash. Um, and this is just a screenshot from um, a local newspaper um, about uh, how they were actively lobbied to have these removed. And we, sometimes Dundee's like a little bit slow off the mark. So we hadn't done ours um, and all this kind of negative stuff was happening. So I approached um, the municipality and just said, look, could we do this? Could this be a UNESCO safe design project? And um, give us the money, give us the budget and we'll deliver this through a co-design process with the community that use that street. And initially that was like, absolutely no chance um, but as the press became more and more negative um, they really then kind of felt well do you know what we've got nothing to lose so they gave us the budget which was £20,000 and we focused on one street and um, which is called Union Street and then um, and our challenge was to kind of um, deliver the project alongside what the government wanted but actually try and get what the businesses wanted out of that and those things were quite um were quite different um so lynn next slide um so uh so as lynn kind of alluded to um we are not uh traditional designers we're not we're not trained we don't and we didn't go to design school or, or anything like that however um uh, we are really passionate and really committed to the um to the role that design has to play and we also acknowledge those different skill sets and that kind of multidisciplinary design teams that you can bring together. So we built um, this project uh, with a, a design team that included um, Service Design Academy, which is a team based in the Dundee Angus College in Dundee, and uh, they deliver design thinking and um, service design training. And we then also had to work to then bring together our on the ground network, our community um, of the people who work and who live um, on that street. 
um, and they were really disconnected. They they barely knew each other actually when the project started. Um, so between us, you know, we carried out a whole host of things. We spoke to people, we held Zoom sessions, um, we held online co-design workshops, we used design thinking methodologies like empathy mapping, um, like uh, user research, like personas, like design safaris, and we really just encouraged people to get out and about. And we had to ensure that the process was open and transparent and that was obviously really difficult for the local um, uh, city officers because that's not something they're used to. Um, but we needed to make sure that the workshop information was um, uh, yeah, it was available to everybody, that regular updates were delivered um, and that all participants were equal. Um, when they came to the table, um, it wasn't that anyone's voice had more weight. Um, so, uh, next slide, Lynn. Um, so in the end, uh, we, through, I mean, I, I've cut you obviously rattling through it, but in the end we delivered, you know, a temporary streetscape, um, which used the old planters just on the previous image, that the council had lying around, um, we cladded them in a really cheap wood, they were planted using plants that were going to be thrown away, um, and, and we were able to get these businesses out and operating in the street, delivering outdoor trading. Now, if anyone's ever been to Scotland, sitting outside and having a drink or having a meal is not a thing that we do up here. Um, it's very European, but it just doesn't feature it in our kind of culture. So this was quite a new experience. Um, and what we needed, what we probably hadn't made clear at the start was that we needed to do testing as part of this design process. And um, we needed to change things and tweak things and move bits around. Um, and one of the things that was really clear uh, sort of a month in was that the traders wanted something more visual. So we commissioned this super graphic, which was painted onto the carriageway. Um, and we collected some data um, to show what was positive and what wasn't positive. And, and that was like pre the super graphic being installed and, and post it. Um, so Lynn, next slide, please. Um, and so basically, you know, the long and the short of it, as, as you all know, um, is that when you give control to the people who live and work um, in these places and they take it out of the hands um, uh, of others, um, this can be a hugely successful and rewarding um, process and can also bring about really tangible outcomes. And one of my challenges is that we often see communities engaged in co-design, in design thinking, in consultation, but they never actually see the contribution or idea come to life. And so they lose interest and it can actually be quite a negative experience um, for them. In this project, we knew we had the money and the thing to deliver. And that is how this project has developed that community um, and has gotten us you know, people who are really now committed to the process of design thinking um, and, and embedding co-design through their work. Um, and so, uh, last slide. Um, and so uh, and so this is not the end. So that's not the end of the story. That image was from about a year ago. Um, and what we've now been asked to do is to develop a phase two proposal um, to take forward a permanent change to the street, um, one which would be used um, with design thinking methodology in this little shop that you see on the screen and where we're going to set up a community co-design studio. And this will be an active studio where people can participate in design workshops and activities and it will really actually shape the future of their, of their street. Um, so yeah, so I just kind of wanted to sort of just end with just just that importance um, for us, you know, of the project has a visible outcome, and it's one in which people can experience, and it's helped us to demonstrate to the whole of Dundee the role that design has in these projects, and that if you deliver through a good process, you can get a really great result, and delivering with those core principles of co-design, people are under, able to understand the role that design has in making that happen, and the importance of design and delivering for the city's future and also for our, our citizens' future. So um, I will leave it there. Um, I, I must apologise, like the formatting of the slides is slightly uh, awry between <laughs> my computer and Lynn's computer um, as well. Uh, but yeah, but I, you know, I really, um, uh, yeah, it's just really great to be here and it's really great to kind of um, just talk about these projects and talk about the way that we that we do things and um, I'm just really keen to make new friends and hear, um, you know, answer any questions and, uh, and that you have. So yeah, sorry, I'll stop rabbiting on now. Um, but yeah, thanks, thank you very much. Thank you very much. 
Annie, and also thank you very much to Lynn. And I would like to ask all of you now to switch on your video so that we can see each other. Um, and so I put on the gallery view. Yeah, yeah, be keen enough to switch on your video. Um, I hope that works for most of you. Thanks. Thanks for uh, thanks for the, the the great presentations or the presentation and and uh, I liked actually I appreciate very much that you were both pointing on that you are not the not the core designers you know you are not the original designers but but that is what design thinking is is looking for we are looking for the for the people who are not designers and I appreciate very much that both of you they were. You were so highly recommending the design process and design thinking process uh, for uh, starting and nurturing that kind of creative activities. Um, thank, thank you very much for, for doing that. I think that is, uh, that is so important. And uh, since I'm originally somehow a designer, so I'm, I always appreciate that very much. I also... Uh, you you made me also think uh, with the with the mushroom network uh, analogy. I, I like that very much. Uh, and you, uh, Lynn, we were talking about that. Um, and and, uh, and now thinking of the the UNESCO City of Design activities. Uh, so uh, I didn't think of that up to now. I didn't think of that kind of network being in the Global Design Thinking Alliance network. So I think there is a great opportunity. Uh, to connect with those people, and I actually started writing an email to the person who is, who was running the Berlin City of Design uh, activity, and uh, luckily I know that person even I, I didn't know that she was doing that, but so um, you inspired me quite quite a bit. Uh, but now it's the floor is open for questions, for uh, applause for sure, and for uh, for uh, comments from all of you. Um, who wants to, who wants to start? Andre, you're looking so serious today. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's different reasons, uh, obviously, but um, I really enjoy your uh, network centric approaches that you have um, displayed. I um, my question is, um, do we do a good job? Um, in building up uh, these networks and providing to uh, networks. Um, in my point of view, that has a lot to do with didactics, with the ability to explain what one is doing and um, how we can uh, contribute to the network. You have a great storytelling and you are, do a really good job. Can you provide us with insights how to explain how we can benefit? What would you prefer as pathways? So in terms of how, how might the network function more effectively or efficiently? I don't know. <laughs> that's that's the, the, the quick answer is I, I don't know. I've been here for three months um, and I've dipped in and out and I think honestly I haven't been the most effective network member um, as part of GVTA just because I'm on a very steep learning curve and that's that's taking all my focus at the moment um, however I would like to ask Annie with regards to how UNESCO stays so global yet so tight-knit what can we learn from the UNESCO network and what can we take from you? Yeah, so um, so I'm lucky in the sense that I've been in this role since 2015. So um, I would say that there's a couple of things, and one of them is is people, and is building um, direct relationships with those others, um, because there's there's nothing that can quite compare with being able um, uh, to just drop someone an email and say let's talk about this or let's develop this collaboration. Um, however, I was actually I was telling Lynn this earlier. Um, uh, on the UNESCO network, we actually have a WhatsApp group, uh, which um, has, I, I don't know how many people in it, and is a great way for very quickly sharing information and people can obviously participate that in that in whatever level they want to. Um, but we have tried and we continually try um, to do to do different things uh, within our design sub network and um, we have uh, four themes 
um, one is design education, one's design business, one's design and policy, and the other one is communications. And so different cities interact with those at different levels and maybe get more involved in some things and, le and less involved in others because it's just such a huge network, it's almost impossible. Um, and we also, much like you do here, you know, ensure that we've got those kind of touch points of, um, of meetings, um, of sharing of learnings uh, and of on and yeah of kind of presenting different ideas to each other. So I think it's probably communication, uh, yeah. talking, keeping it open as much as possible. And um, and and also I know we're obviously all stuck in our own places, and um, but we really valued meeting in person, and we tried to do that as much as we possibly could as well. Yeah, absolutely agree here. So it's it's sort of a trade. So if you're a business developer and you have a product. Uh, and you are uh, entering a company, uh, you don't know how this product exactly fits into the company and the people on the other side of the desk doesn't know it too, how should they? So there's really a process of coming together and finding out um, how can this product or how could we as design thinkers be beneficial for this partner? And I would say this is um, a tool of the trade we should learn we could learn it from you and i think as design thinkers we are by trade really good at this we mm. just have to cultivate it yeah. thank you yeah yeah thank you before i hand over to mats uh, i would like to welcome luis de la pena in mexico and uh, enjoy your meal luis i'm happy to see you so <laughs> so what but now the uh, now uh, mats from open lab stockholm uh your, your question <laughs> Hello, Luis. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hello, fully. I'm I'm happy to be here and just listening and uh, trying to to get in the mood for for everything. I'm I'm learning just for what I'm listening. Thank you very much, and good to see you. Very nice to see you. Good, good to see you. Okay, over to Mats. Thank you for a very interesting presentation, which got me thinking all over the place. And maybe the presentation was a little bit all over the place in a positive sense, I would say, because you're a museum, but you do design for business. And, and that sort of intrigued me. Uh, how, how, how do these two circles come together? So maybe you can comment a bit about that i'm not that that familiar with with the um maybe more familiar with edinburgh and so but 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 still um i i really liked your presentation but but and, and also the presentation about uh, to me it was something like reclaiming the city street space for for at least some of your images show that and at open Eye Stockholm we we are working with social innovation so it's a lot about reclaiming the city and who is the city for so so and, and a lot about co-design and also co-creation so maybe you can comment a bit about how how is your relation to the rest of the city and and you also mentioned something about so service design and how does that relate to, to social innovations, which we are particularly interested in. So, so yeah, I really liked your your presentation. It was it was very Scottish. Uh, maybe that's just uh, well, yeah, yeah. And, and we know all about Scotland and England and so on. It, it, do you think that this is a trend in all of Great Britain, or is or is your perspective more a bit Scottish? So that was my my initial thoughts. Annie, do you want to? I'm just like, I'm not, as I'm trying to write down a few wee pointers there. Um, yes, it's very, we are very Scottish. Um, and I think uh, uh, our, the way we do things is slightly different. Um, and uh, yeah, it's great. <laughs> um, we, I was just going to pick up maybe just on the, um, you kind of, you made a comment about um, the sort of like reclaiming of the city um so I'll let Lynn maybe pick up on the design and the business um, museum sort of chat but this kind of reclaiming of the city and uh, the kind of service design thing like we um this this city Dundee has huge challenges 
and um, they are economic, they are social, and they are environmental. And we need to use all of our skills possible to solve some of these problems. And we have to have design absolutely at the core of that and of our designers and our, and our citizens need to be, I don't say this right, but need to be maybe taught or maybe need to have been given the opportunity to have some of these skills because they are some of the best people that we have to solve problems because they know the city best, they know it's, they know the issues and they want to reclaim it. They they see the city as a place in which they live um, and that needs to kind of work for them. And I think when you come from a place like Dundee, we are very proud of the place that we are and we don't want to let it, I, I guess sometimes, you know, you see cities and maybe the city centre has, there's a lot of, um, you know, people have left the city centre and it, it's it's um, fallen into disrepair and it's it's no longer loved. You know, we don't we don't want that to happen. You know, we're still fighting for it um, as well. And on the service design thing, and I guess from my perspective, I think co-design, service design, design thinking, co-creation, it's all it's muddled in amongst the same sort of thing. And uh, we would love for Dundee, but there is an ambition for Scotland to be a nation uh, of design thinkers, of people who use, who put design at the core of developing uh, their services and the services for our for our people, I guess. And, um, and that is actually something which DNA Dundee is, is going to be leading on um, and, uh, and helping Scotland think through. And I think that's really, really exciting and does show even more of a gap between Scotland and England and how we're approaching those those kind of problems. Um, uh, Lynn, I'll let you pick up on the other bits. That was a really nice segue into the kind of cultural chat. <laughs> Beautifully done. Um, so on why are we running a, this isn't exactly what you said, Matt, but there was that piece of we're a museum, but we've also got this design for business programme. What is actually that all about? And when I first started, having come from the business support background, I was coming at it with a different head on, maybe slightly more commercial, um, but then spending time in the museum and actually looking at, well, what are we doing here? Coming into those four base priorities is an absolute gift because it allowed me to measure any activity that I wanted to do against the, the four priorities that VNA Dundee are, are hoping to embody. But why a museum and why a business support programme? I think it depends on what your view of what museums are and what they should be um, and what they have been in the past and what they can be in the future. And at v &A Dundee, we sit in that slightly more future museum space, but we draw from what museums do. So any museum that you go to will have an outreach programme for communities. Um, if they've got a small modest budget for it. Any museum that you go to is more about experience rather than giving people knowledge. It's about knowledge transfer, but it's experiential knowledge transfer. Um, and for us at Design for Business, thinking like a museum, and I said this in the presentation, but just to reiterate, it's about shifting a culture, which speaks to what Annie had just said there. It's about how do we make as big an impact as we possibly can with a small team in a museum in order to shift the dial on how we experience design in Scotland. And Design for Business for the past five years has been doing that brilliantly. Um, we have a whole host of case studies sitting on our server, not that they're, they're doing any good there, but they will come out at some point. Um, but just to show you, just to kind of let people know what, has happened out of the design for business program you know people have come in with very technical um technical issues that they've come in with who have then gone back into their organization and completely transformed how they've done it how they think and use design across different departments um, we have an incredible opportunity here for a cultural shift and i think for it to come from a museum a cultural institution as opposed to directly from government i think it's much warmer and it's much more centered in place 
Um, and like Annie said, for Dundonians and for the people of Scotland, that is a really important aspect for how people experience um, this type of work in design thinking. That might have been a muddled answer as well. I covered a lot in that. And if you need any clarification, please ask. Um, but yeah, we want, it's a cultural thing. We are a cultural institution. We will shift the culture on how Scots experience design and design for business is one way of doing that. And UNESCO network being part of the v &A family is part of that. And as are our brilliant departments right across the museum, we're all here for that aim. And it's brilliant to have that in the context of an incredible building in an exciting city. Th mm. Thank you for your answer. In, in some sense or shape of the word, you are happy compatriots uh, in, in this. The museum and the business world can, can uh, coexist in this sense. Thank you for your answer. Yeah, thank you. And let's move to Nalin. It's very late in India right now. I'm happy that you're still up. Thank, thanks for joining, Nalin. Thanks, Professor. It's it's eight thirty, and uh, it's it's a wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, thanks for organizing it. And Annie and Lynn, uh, you guys actually rocked the show. Two two uh, two different flavors. Two different flavors. One is on the storyline, uh, and another one is on the practical side. How would actually uh, you actually practice? So uh, two thumbs up to both of you. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, two simple questions. Uh, uh, one first to Annie. Uh, uh, what are the challenges that you started to see uh, between uh, the design thinking and the realization of uh, the idea that you tried to actually propose? And uh, to uh, Lynn, uh, do you see that uh, there's a uh, museum and the storytelling, the entire uh, design element? How much do the kids in uh, uh, the Scotland and uh, there uh, over there gets the best out of it? Um, great. Right, I'm going to go first. Uh, <laughs> just going in. Um, oh, what a great question, Alan. Like, um, because it's such a great question, because I think so often people have a preconceived idea of the end result. And the experience of using design thinking can lead you to a very different place. And I very much see my role as someone who connects those two, um, what can be sometimes quite vastly different worlds and navigate the, um, navigate those challenges. So it, it's, it's absolutely, it's things like in the design thinking process, what came up um, was just, was like one of the things was like, shut the road completely. We want bollards and barriers and we do not want any cars for people to access the street. The reality of that is that we need access for bin collections, for deliveries, for the fire brigade, etc. So I can't deliver what they want. And so we then need to um, have this kind of intermediary sort of uh, session where we're like, well, this is what you want. And here's the problems of why we can't quite achieve it and, and bring that back again. And, and do that testing. So, so we have actually, what's, what's quite interesting in that as an example, is that we started off no bollards whatsoever, total disaster, people just driving up the street. Um, so then we implemented, we moved some planters around, made a little chicane um, better, but people now drive into the planters and damage them all the time and they constantly have to be repaired. So now we've built an, an opening gate that the business in the morning, clo they close the gate and then they open the gate again at the agreed time. Again, it's not perfect, but it's been through three iterations. And, and that's, yeah, that's the bit that I find really fascinating. And I think that's the bit that you need people like me who understand the issues in the municipalities, officers and all of that kind of legal planning stuff. And then, and then that the actual, the designers and the creativity and the inspiration. But yeah, that's, um, yeah, it's pretty big. It's a big challenge, and it's a great question. Yeah, uh, Lynn, I'll let you um, uh, pick up. Cool. Yeah, lots um, of iterations needed. <laughs> so on that on that storytelling piece, we are. I'm really fortunate in my my brand new team at Design for Business that we are a, the team of storytellers. I have that as a background in in terms of a creative practice. And the designs that you saw on the slides, like with the little kind of foldy people and 
uh, the yeah the designs on my slides were done by my team member Lee Johnson, who is has just um, published a well submitted a paper for publishing um, around storytelling and design, visual storytelling, and how do we how do we actually help people understand what the design experience is like if they haven't gone through it and telling stories either verbally or visually is the most engaging way to do that because we are we're storytelling beasts it's what we do it's the thing that has helped us survive as a species up until now and I think it's the thing that will help us survive all of the nonsense that's coming um, our way over the course of, of the next few decades and beyond as well so in terms of storytelling that's going to sit right at the heart of design for business not just around engagement in terms of getting clients in to, to do the thing where we can actually start generating revenue and, and keep that business side of things going, but it's about that, that cultural storytelling, helping people understand what these things are doing for them, what the potentials are for it as well. Um, and I think in, I'm going to sound really cliched and a bit trite here, but we're all kids. We all want information in the simplest way possible in the most direct way possible um, and visual verbal storytelling is a way to do that and I'm glad having seen some comments that that's resonated with with you guys today it's kind of it's a little bit of a validation on the approach that we're going to start taking around how we start to to engage fully um, with folk out with our design sphere because we all get it like we all get it and we can talk till the cows come home about how we all get it but it's how do we bring in the folk that Annie works with that are really like I don't like what? <laughs> how is this going to help me with my business? So it's figuring out how that works. Um, in terms of in terms of like the children children coming into the museum and experiencing design, we have an excellent learning team. And Annie and Uli and I were chatting and beforehand about this. Our learning team has an outreach program that goes into schools. We've got a families and communities team that go out and work with with the hard to reach families in the in Dundee area. And um, so people come in. An experience being a Dundee. How much of that is experiencing the design process? I'm. I that needs to be improved. That desperately needs to be improved. I think people come into this beautiful building and they look at artifacts and they might not necessarily make the connection between that and actually what's happening on Union Street is really benefiting businesses. These processes are really hidden, and with Annie working to make them visible, um, in a different way to how B and A does it in terms of these are artifacts, here's process. I think this is a really interesting point in, in the organization's development where we can start to have more of those conversations around what visibility looks like um, and what experience looks like. But everyone who comes to us has a brilliant time and enjoys that encounter, but I think it could be richer with more communication about the design process. I hope that answers your question, Nellan. <laughs> Perfect, thanks a lot, both of you. Thank you, thanks. So. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for your questions and a special, a special big thank you to Lynn and Annie uh, for your great talk and your insights on what, what you're doing to bring design thinking closer to the streets, on the streets, you know, bring it really to the people and have them involved and engaged. I like that very much. Since I heard my church, the church bells here next next to uh, our house here, like five minutes ago, I know that we are five minutes over time now. Uh, so officially, you know, we have the recording running for those who cannot participate today. So to make it accessible later on the website, uh, for um, for us, I would close now with our slide. Steffi, you have the 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 slide for our next spotlight in may yeah thanks um the, our next spotlight session will uh will have will host mugendi from south africa he is actually a part of the planning committee for our decon festival which will happen in october 15 uh, october 12th to 14th and on May 12th, he will give us a little insight in empathy and community, human-centered design in Africa. And I'm looking forward to that. So that will be our next session in May. And uh, I would like to thank all of you for participating and would officially now end our GDTA Spotlight session of April. Thanks again to our friends and colleagues from Scotland, from VNA Dundee, and I'm so, eager i want to visit i want to see the streets 
colorful as you have designed it. Uh, and I want to see the great building and I want to be part of your activities with the kids, because that is what we are focusing on very soon, very intensively. So thanks a lot. Officially, it's now over and I'm looking forward to the next round.